tonight on CrossFeed. A change in Chinese policy. Ban the iPhone. Mid-East Christianity. Going, going, gone. Arguing with God in the Old Testament. And Jerusalem goes down the hole. It's a big hole. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Crossfeed Religious News. After a long hiatus, I am Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Dr. Jim Butler, pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. And it is good to be back after, yes, a long break, at which uh, Dale and I both were on vacation and doing some other good things. Yeah. Uh, I got a chance to... Um, go to Germany and visit my daughter and go to Wittenberg. And so I am all Luthered up, including my Luther beer glass. So we have our Luther beer glass today, tonight, and drinking, well, actually, it's the Sam Adams Oktoberfest, but it actually had Luther beer. So they, they, they serve that. And next week, what I do this, is I'll try to wear my Luther socks. But <laughs> Reforma- our Reformation episode, I'll definitely be wearing my Luther socks. <laughs> Well, they say, here I stand. The farthest I went was Wisconsin um, to take a daughter to school. Um, but uh, I, we've, uh, we've been busy, and though, too. Did you all the way home? Uh, no. <laughs> Obviously, you haven't received the tuition bill yet. Then you'll cry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's something else entirely. Now, you know, I'll tell you, nowadays with Facebook, I know everything that's going on. <laughs> you know? So it's really easy to stay in touch. That's what um, she wants you to think. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, but uh, no, we've been really busy around here. Uh, we, after eighteen months of work, uh, we rolled out our um, the vision to the congregation. Um, we've uh, imp- we've uh, announced and are in the process of implementing a new discipleship program called uh, journey groups and interest groups so that uh, everything that we do around here will involve uh, aspects of spiritual growth. Um, uh, Because by the way, uh, you know, if people aren't aware of this, right, uh, just having people involved in activities at church, there's not some magical thing about, Um, being on the property that will cause them to grow spiritually. It just doesn't work that way. Um, So, Dale, did you really think, you know, your idea for a vision of where we're going in the future, that, you know, the theme, we're going to die, you know, (laughs) you know, (laughs) you know, I mean, with the subtitle, follow Pastor Dale off the cliff, you bunch of lemmings, you know, I just, you know, I don't know if that was the the, the best theme I've ever heard somebody come up with. (laughs) Well, just you know, giving him a hard time, folks. Yeah, you know, it, it came down to that, or um, you know, the world's going to end in you know November. So, give me all your money now. So that's right. It's twenty twelve. <laughs> what difference does it make? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we've been really busy putting that all together, and um, and so today we had our governing board election. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, for one, in in seeing what we're doing here, um, and also we have. Uh, we've started streaming our services uh, on YouTube. So uh, if you're interested in seeing any of that, some people have expressed interest in seeing what our modern service looks like, um, you can go to uh, youtube.com slash user slash, and our username is SOT Ridge. And um, so you can go in and check that out. The videos are there. Or if you um, just go to the Shepherd of the Ridge Facebook page, you'll see links to them on there too. Um, so you can see uh, the the journey group uh, presentation that we uh, gave today, um, and people have also asked about the accountable leader model, uh, which is used a lot uh, with the Transforming Churches Network, and um, we also put together a uh, video explaining that as well. So um, so you can find all of that at, at uh, YouTube, SOT Ridge. So. So I, I I take it I can access your videos using my iPhone. Yes, you can. You can even watch them live with your iPhone. I can, even though it is an ob- abomination and a disgusting file device. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's what it comes down to. Um, certain groups of fundamentalist Jews don't like Jesus, and they don't like the Jesus phone either. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, um, what group is he part of? Um, uh, a, a, a um, Jewish rabbi in B'nai Barak. Uh, he's called the Teacher of Uprightness. And he invited dozens of his students to an iPhone smashing ceremony. Uh, this is in Jerusalem. Uh, Rabbi Leo, Leor Glazer. Um, and uh, he said um, uh, he inveiled against anyone uh, possessing a, 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 an iPhone. A religious person who owns this impure device is an abomination and a disgusting, vile villain. Um, and he told all these wonderful stories about a man who purchased an iPhone, which ruined his life, and on account of which he divorced from his wife. <laughs> all right. So the, the, the argument against them um, is that that gives open access um, to uh, pornography as well as sources of information beyond the strict confines of the ultra orthodox world. So, in other words, it's um, I mean, because yet you can't find pornography without an iPhone, um, and apparently, I don't know, and uh, the you would know uh, more than I. <laughs> I'm just going based on this article. Oh, I am. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, trying to figure it out anyway. And, um, yeah, it, you know, and, and, and you know, you don't want your people knowing too much. It sounds like a cult. Yeah, it does very much. So it says, um, uh, it, but he doesn't have just have a problem with iPhones. He also does not like I Androids, Blackberries, or anything else. Um, he says they have brought a spiritual holocaust and seriously endanger the holiness of the house of Israel. Yeah, but you can get a kosher phone uh, that has no internet connection and can't send or receive text messages. Yeah, we call those the jitterbug. <laughs> you can like like the Firefly phone, you know, that you can call home or nine one one, and that's it. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, what more do you need? Yeah, right, right. The synagogue, uh, right? You know, so. yeah. You can just buy a simple phone. Well, you know, I mean. <sighs> Yeah, you hear this is I think goes back to to Jesus' words: "Out of the heart come all these things." You know, you can you can try and ban these things, but the evil's still there, right? You know, and and why are you finding the evil on this stuff? Because the evil in your heart is leading you there, right? You, you go looking for it. You know, I mean, the reality. It, it, all right, so we have um, my kids have iPhones. All right, and so. There is a, a browser available for free. There's better ones out there that you can pay for, but there is a free one called Ranger, um, and it is a Safari-based browser. Uh, but what it does is it disables Safari on the on the iPhone, and uh, and it provides uh, content filtering. Now the problem with it is there's no way to set how much or how little it filters, so it's pretty strict. I mean, like. My kids complain like, "Well, I went to, you know, the Bob Evans website to look at their menu, and I would blocked me, you know." So I don't, I don't know, <laughs> bacon, <laughs> you know, bacon. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but well, yeah, you're you know, the Smothers Brothers making naked bacon. Anyway, uh, it's kind of, kind of that, that routine suddenly flew in my mind. Um, but yeah, sometimes you get those types of, of crazy things. Or uh, the other thing you can do is go to uh, Family Shield through mm -hmm. Open DNS. And um, you can uh, punch in the uh, DNS routers um, on, on there, and so that will, you know, put their filters directly onto your iPhone. Um, and so, um, but you have to do it with every wireless, with with every um, Wi-Fi that they use. Mm -hmm. So we have one, you know, so the one at the house you have to do, and if they go to someplace else, they have to. Um, but they, you know, it has to be done for each one of those. But otherwise, I mean, you know, you can do that too on the iPhone. Right. So there are ways to do it. There's actually better if, if parents 
I mean, since we're talking about it, if parents are looking for content filtering, uh, that sort of thing, it's actually the stuff for Android is better. There's, there's more available for that. Um, but, uh, but it's also easier to circumvent because it's an open system. And so it, it'll, it'll keep your kids, you know, if, if your kids are hackers, they'll be able to find ways around it. Um, but, you know, if, if your kids are hackers, you know, if, if, if you distrust them that much, um, maybe you should limit their access to smartphones. <laughs> yeah, go, go buy a kosher a cell phone, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That was, was it, somebody said, uh, you know, boy, what, can't I just get a, a, a cell phone, um, you know, that, that just I can just use to, to call people and, and, and doesn't do anything else? And they go, yeah, yeah, you can find those. Where? The Smithsonian. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, my wife wanted a phone that would just call and text. That was it. We, we, it took us ages to find one. Yeah. Um, they just basically don't exist. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But, you know, but the, the, but the, the answer is not to take, you know, a bunch of iPhones and destroy them. Um, you know, that is just not going to work. And I want to meet the people who've got the money to go out and buy an iPhone just to tear it apart. I mean, I want to meet the guy who's got the 800 bucks to, you know. I've never understood that because then you're giving money to the company that you're decrying. <laughs> it's like going out and buying a bunch of pornographic magazines so you can burn them. Um, <laughs> you're supporting still, the industry. They, they got the money. They don't care they what don't you do care. with it now. Yeah, no kidding. Not not. They don't want to know what you do with them. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's just a little bit of silliness. Uh, well, I guess maybe they need to have an independent mind. They need to be able to think. There you go. This is a really interesting article. Yes, written also, by the way, by a rabbi. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is in the Wall Street Journal. Um, it's called "The God of Independent Minds," and um, basically, it's talking about how the, the sort of New atheism movement, uh, Richard Dawkins and, um, Sam Harris talk about how, um, religion, uh, well, he, he says religious belief discourages questioning by its very nature. Um, and religion represents a vanishing point beyond which rational discourse proves impossible. Reason and revelation are opposites. And, and so, in other words, God has said it, and therefore you don't question it, and that's it. And and so you just, you know, check your brain at the door. Because we know there's, you know, absolutely no understanding of any type of orthodoxy within atheism. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have certain things that you dare not ever question. Yeah, that's so funny too, isn't it? I mean, the the irony there. You know, it, it, yeah. Go to a go to an uh, some, you know, an atheist convention, and that's the thing. Like, well, there's no organized movement of you know, it's it's just you know, like oh, right, yeah. You can't go to atheist conventions or anything like that, you know. <laughs> but uh, then, uh, yeah, go to one of those things and uh, question evolution, question um, gay rights. Um, uh, uh, abortion. Uh, I do know some atheists that are pro-life. Um, and uh, at least one. And he said he used to be pro-choice, but then he realized he couldn't figure out where to draw the line. And he said, until I can figure out where to draw the line, I'm just not comfortable saying that it's okay to, um, to end the uh, human life. And, um, yeah. You know, so he he says, I, I do believe there's a line there somewhere, but I don't know where it is. And, and I, I think that any any choice of a line, just choosing one, is that it is inherently arbitrary. So I and I really appreciate that comment from him. I do too. I do too. Okay. So anyway, but uh, he's saying no. Um, actually, just the opposite. Uh, he's speaking as an Orthodox Jew. Um, and he says, uh, you know, he says, I'll let Christians speak for themselves, but I think I can, you know, but I think he, he argues very well for me that just arguing that, no, uh, uh, questioning, uh, having independent thought and action is very much a part of, um, 
the um, biblical faith. Right, right. And not just questioning the world, other people, you know, that kind of thing, but actually questioning God. Um, you know, and, and he points out that the Bible is full of that. You have Abraham, um, you know, on talk, talking to God about the fate of Sodom. Uh, you have Moses convincing God to um, not to destroy Israel. Uh, you have, you know, Israel itself, the name means wrestles with God. And um, so, you know, I've been, uh, what was it, a few weeks back, I preached on Habakkuk. Man, that, I mean, and I'll tell you, that was that was a hard sermon to write. It's it's a hard uh, book to um, to read and and you know, kind of wrap your head around. Um, it makes you think, you know, I mean, for them to say that, that you check your brain at the door and, and, mm -hmm. and that reason has no point. Wow. That's just, it's pure ignorance. Right. He, um, or it's interesting. Um, the, um, Psalms of lament. Mm -hmm. And these people question God, and they say, "I've been crying all night on my, you know, my couch. It's soaking wet. Where are you right now?" And they're they're questioning God. And it's interesting. I was listening to an Old Testament scholar this week uh, on on a podcast I've been listening to, and he said um, that there are actually more psalms of lament than there are psalms of praise. Hmm. And I thought that was interesting. There are more quotes psalms where they question God the way that they praise God. Well, you look at, I mean, the classic David psalm is, God, I'm, I'm crying out to you, I'm in need, I'm, uh, my enemies are surrounding me, on and on and on. And then at the end he says, but I'm going to trust in you, and, and, it's, and I thank you uh, for your deliverance. And, he, and that deliverance, he's, that thankfulness is before the deliverance actually, actually comes. No matter what, I'm going to trust in you, and, and somehow you're going to deliver me. A friend of mine and I have been working on those uh, psalms of lament together. And yeah, at the end of them, they often say, but I'm going to trust you. I praise you, whatever. And we're both. So is David really majorly bipolar? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, now, or, or did he, you know, come back to the psalm later when kind of life was resolved and said, man, God really was there. You know, or, you know what was going on? You know, so we're we're trying to figure that out this whole thing, right, what yeah. happened and stuff. Yeah, is it? Is but you it see, like... I think you know the argument that you can't argue with God that you're, you know, whatever. I think it almost has this idea of inspiration being like, uh, it being, you know, the dic little dictaphones. Yeah, you know, they went into a trance and they started writing it, and they came back out and go, "Oh wow, man, that's cool. I wrote that. That's what God had to say." Rather than being this real organic process. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, they, 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 they did. I mean, every one of them. Um, and sometimes they stood up, you know, these people in the Bible, they, they, they looked what God said and they made judgments based on what they believed God said. Uh, so, you know, we had the, the Hebrew midwives. Uh, they didn't have a God coming down and saying, you know, don't kill the baby boys, but they're going, okay, from what we know of our faith, is God in favor of death or of life? You right. know, we believe. God wants us to protect these children. Mm -hmm. And they did. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and that's, I think that's something that's important for people to understand. It is okay to question God, to say, God, what is going on? This doesn't make sense to me. You know, it is, it is scriptural to do that and, and to struggle with that. And, you know, if you, um, of all things, um, uh, Monty Python, the Holy Grail, all right, which is not the most reverent, uh, you know, piece of film. Um, <laughs> but there's this this great piece where uh, where God first appears to them to tell them to go seek the Holy Grail, and and they're all like bowing down and and all that kind of stuff, and God goes, "Oh, just knock it off, stand up, you know, and, and stuff." And um and yeah, we need to be reverent before God. Um, but it, it's sort of the the point that. Uh, you know, God wants to be in, in communication and relationship with us too, all right? And if you're in relationship with somebody, um, then you need to, it needs to be a real relationship. And, um, and there's going to be times where you're, um, 
really, especially as long as we're, you know, in this world, um, there's going to be times where you're just going, what is going on? And there's going to be other times where, um, you know, where you're really like, oh, this is great. Oh, you know, I get it. And, um, you know, but you even look at, um, at Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, even there, even he says, you know, if, if the, if this cup can be taken from me and, you know, no one's tighter, there's no, you know, better relationship than the relationship among the Trinity. And, and yet even there, you know, he does that. It's not that he was arguing with God or disagreeing or anything, but you know, there's these tensions that they're there. And, and it's not that when you become a Christian, just everything's golden and, you know, and it's all great. No, Christianity is all about dealing with when things are not all great. I mean, that's, and that's a very powerful thing that, you know, it's all about dealing with things that are not real great. And, and, and then having the permission to, to, to question God and question life at that time. Um, but I think when you question God, you show there's a relationship with Him. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. So I think that's a, 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 an, a good point. Um, gosh, uh, well, speaking of questioning God, you know, one thing that, it dawned on me, oh, about one or two, a year or two ago, as I began to hear about how Christians were disappearing in the Middle East. And I began to question, you know, are some of the U.S. policies really helpful? Or are they hurting our brothers and sisters? And where are this whole area that I like, you know, that I've often talked about called, you know, the uh, um, uh, power of unintended consequences? Mm hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, this as I was reading this article, and this is from uh, Chronicles magazine. Chronicles, uh, published by the Rockford Institute. And um, the um, the title is "The Disappearing Middle Eastern Christians," um, and it made me think about uh, before the Iraq War. I was all free Iraq, and you know, very anti Saddam Hussein, and I knew what he was doing to the Kurds and and stuff like that, and and I was really like, man, we got to get rid of this guy. And, um, you know, he was, he was terrible. He was murdering people and raping people, all kinds of stuff. He's just a terrible human being. And, um, you know, but then ever since he's been removed, it's become terrible for the Christians there. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, cause he had a secular government that, and they had religious freedom there. And well, uh, at least to a certain extent they did. Um, uh, and, uh, there was a good sized Christian community within Iraq, um, yeah, yeah, and but now uh, in Iraq, the Christian community is pretty much gone. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> let's put it like this: he was brutal. He was e equal opportunity brutal. Yeah, um, you know, some of the Islamists who are in charge are brutal, just as brutal, but they're not as brutal to other Muslims. So you know, it's kind of that way. Uh, the Middle East, uh, Hansi Mubarak, you know, was was was, was no good guy. But now he's been removed by the Muslim Brotherhood, who are, you know, persecuting the Coptic Christians. Um, Syria, we have Assad, uh, who is another Baathist, um, <clears throat> and definitely no nobody that we normally want in charge of a country. But uh, the rebels against him again are um, fundamentalist uh, Muslims, and if he's kicked out. Where is that going to lead the Christian community? Right. Uh, and it, it, it's very interesting. I have a um, member of my church who's married to a guy who's Syrian Orthodox, and his family lives in Damascus. Oh, wow. So he was, you know, he said there's a lot of stuff, you know, you don't hear about uh, what's going on over there. But, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a huge question, you know, if, if, if Assad falls, if, you know, if, they, if he's overthrown, you know, what's going to happen to the Christian community there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah he, and it, he and his brother live here in the United States. They're trying to get his parents out of there now. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just that's a that's a huge thing for um, for Christians in mm -hmm. the United States who have family over in the Middle East. Um, and and what do I do? To try to get them out of there. Um, worried about uh, sort of uh, 
repercussions of, of things. Uh, we had a, um, last year, year before, uh, for the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Um, oh, it's coming up again. Um, the, we had a, um, a pastor right here in Ohio. Um, that is doing Muslim evangelism. I'm, sh- I'm sure I mentioned it um, when we did it. Um, and they're starting a church of Muslims who've become Christians. And But it's become a really dangerous thing for them um, because they are, um, they're, they're afraid that if word gets out, gets back to where their families are, um, in the Middle East, that their families will be persecuted over their actions. Right. Um, but it's, you know, you read this stuff, this, this, this article, and I think it's, it, it is, yeah, you know, here's the, you know, the law of unintended consequences. You know, what do we, how do, you know, we, we, what do we do, um, as the Middle East has been changing? And a lot of these regimes were not are regimes that where Christians have been protected are not good regimes. Um, you know, uh, Assad and um, Hussein were Baathists. Well, <laughs> Baathists are Nazis. Um, that's how that's exactly how they are. Um, they um, we had you know the do- you know the dominance of Britain. And it was under the British rule that the secularist, secularist rising came up and it became kind of a secular state. Um, and then, uh, but the, you know, most of the people didn't like the, the British ruling things. And so then we had a period of decolonization, of the British pulling back, uh, the decolonialization and these more secular people, but they still hated the British. Mm-hmm. Well, then we had the rise of the Nazis in Germany. And we had the basic rule of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so a lot of these countries develop relationships with the Nazi government. And they're basically Nazi in their, their outlook and understanding and fascist. But a lot of them also, um, for example, um, Assad, are members themselves a religious minority or a secular minority. And how could they – but they, and they're surrounded by Sunni Muslims. Well, what they did was they co-opted all these other minorities into the government. So if you put enough minorities together, you had a majority. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in terms of numbers against that, you know. so And, and so you got a lot of these um, uh, Muslims then who are partly angry with the Christians and some of these other groups because they've been – on the side of Assad and some of these other people for so long. Although they don't really like him that much, they're just glad, you know, they know under him they won't get killed. I mean, uh, Tariq Aziz, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's foreign minister, was Presbyterian. Yeah. Um, you're not going to see a Presbyterian in Iran, Iraq's government again for a long time. Um, the other thing is, uh, you, you know, reading through this is it brings you this question, you know, that this American idea that democracy is always a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, democracy is a good thing. I mean, when, when you look at, at the writings um, of the founding fathers of the United States, uh, they made it very clear that democracy is good if the people are um, – if if the people are right minded, it's very much based on morality, and in fact is based very much on the Bible. And not to say that we're a Christian nation, I I, I don't believe that. Um, but at the same time, they saw the principles in the Bible of right. um, you know taking care of each other and 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 loving each other and and looking out for the marginalized people. Um, you know, that it was based on those concepts. I mean, we would call those natural law, all right? right. Um, which is why they did it um, not as a, a, a religious thing so much, but as, um, yeah, you know, this is right. 
and um, and, and, and we do things to gum up the works. I mean, to keep you know, democracy from being overcome by passion. You know, that that was the House of Representatives. That was expected to turn over quickly as passions overtook people. You know, and that's why everybody's up for election every two years. The Senate was a third every two years, so you had more moderation. Uh, it also was equal representation from every state to help, you know, which they thought would help moderate it. Of course, and originally senators were not elected by the people. They were elected uh, by somebody, I, I think that the state legislatures put the forth the senators. But it, the whole idea was to slow the, the passions that democracy might bring about. You know, people, you know, if they forget, we, they think we're a democracy. We're not. We're a constitutional republic. Mm-hmm. And there's a very different understanding of government when, when, when you understand that. Uh, but, I mean, I, I, and they always say, well, if you go, go to Hitler, you've lost the argument. But I think it's important for us to remember that Hitler was democratically elected. Once he was in office, he made sure that he, there, there would be another, you know, that wasn't going to change. He always would be. But he was originally elected. Yeah. Well, you know, Saddam Hussein had uh, um, every uh, every however often had elections, too. <laughs> That's right. That they, they just, uh, yeah. you know, that you had to sign your name to the ballot. <laughs> I'm talking his original election to office. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, this guy also, though, talks about some... Um, um, you know, now this is a conservative group. They, yeah, you know, he really seems to be attacking the going after the Obama administration quite strongly here. Uh, but you know, let's be honest. This would, you know, if we had a Republican administration, would things be that much different? Yeah, probably not. You know, I don't think they would be. Um, now he 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 objects that the you know like the. Uh, um, that Obama was supposed, and his national security team were supposed to meet with some Christians, but at the, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt objected, and so they canceled the meeting. Something like that, maybe somebody else might not have, might, might have changed. But I mean, we're dealing with foreign countries. We only have so much pull. And foreign countries, by the way, that I don't know if anybody noticed this week, don't like America very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so why would they listen to us? Or at least have some people in them that don't like America very much. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, you know, as, as soon as we found uh, um, um, Bin Laden, you know, down the street from the Capitol, you know, <laughs> like, wait a minute, these guys were our allies. <laughs> That's right. Now, um, is this any way to treat an intimate friend? So you know, yeah. Um, well, you know, and that's the other piece of this whole thing is that um, what we're running into with uh, where a lot of the the terrorists have have gotten their um, their money and their weapons and and all that kind of stuff from the United States government because we trained them and outfitted them back during the Cold War, uh, and it made sense back then. Enemy of my enemy is my friend, you know. But then Cold War's done, and <laughs> like, oh well, now we have all this stuff and. They never really liked the United States, but they were happy to take all of our, you know, <laughs> money and guns, <laughs> training. Whatever. A lot of this, I mean, you know, you just got to kind of remember um, that there's a lot of, um, um, you know, that that, that they, 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 it's a Muslim fundamentalism that I think most Americans just cannot understand. We we have no, we cannot understand. You know, this idea that you must believe this or we will kill you. If you're female, we will rape you. I mean, there's just not this understanding that, you know, we will force you to, to, to become Muslim. And if you ever don't become Muslim, if you want to ever do something else, we will kill you. Yeah. Yeah. And then even they mention uh, the women being taken away, raped, and then um, and then they basically forced uh, to convert. They don't really convert, but they claim that they've converted, you know, and um, and then they're never heard from again. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's so hard to just to understand that mentality, you know, that it, and that it exists, that it's so widespread. And right. when you consider how widespread it is in that part of the world, you start talking about democracy. It's like, uh, you know, there's something to be said for having a dictator in there that, um, that realizes that, you know, to run a country, you, uh, you at least have to figure out what to do about the people in your country. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's very frustrating because I mean, in my, my heart goes out to, to, to my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it really does. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I look at it from other perspectives of government and stuff. You know, what should be done to somebody who's brutalizing his own people? Right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, who had his, you know, little torture chambers and stuff. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, of course, my other, you know, the, the other part of me sits back and says, another question is, um, um, uh, I forgot where that thought was coming from. Just lost it. Oh, well. Guess it wasn't that important anyway. So oh. it's, yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, you can't win for losing. Yeah, they need Jesus. That would help. I mean, I mean boy, you look at the, you look at the stuff that's going on there and you think, what if they had Jesus? How different it would it be? You know, the guy coming along that says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow, what if they did that? What if they did? Might make things different, but it's not helping now. Uh, or maybe they will just figure out some other reason why it may. Um, or maybe if pressure was brought to bear, it might make a change. It certainly did in China. Yeah, <laughs> this was kind of interesting. Um, so everybody's familiar with the um, China's one child policy, right? Um, and uh, specifically, it's it's had terrible repercussions on the country. It's just starting to happen, and, and who knows what this is going to lead to. Um, because in that nation, um, boys are considered superior to girls, and um, and so it's it's led to a lot of um, – girls being aborted while they're waiting to have their one child be a boy, um, which is part of the problem. The greater problem is they're killing a lot of babies. Um, and specifically, uh, not just that they're doing that, but they're forcing it. Um, that they forced women to sign consent forms and, um, and there's, one case that drew attention uh, where a woman who was seven months pregnant was beaten by family planning officials, forced to sign an abortion consent form, and toxins were injected into the brain of her unborn daughter. She gave birth to her deceased child. On June 4th, a picture of her lying in a hospital bed next to the baby was released. And so that... Now, interestingly, uh, there was a similar... Uh, situation where a picture was released uh, back in 2006, but it didn't get picked up by the media. Um, but this one did, and you might say it went viral. And um, <clears throat> and the pressure resulting from that has caused the um, China's Population and Family Planning Commission to issue an order to ban the use of forced abortion when enforcing its one-child policy. Now, it's not to say that all of a sudden it's um, the one-child policy is no longer in effect. It's not to say that uh, women aren't still forced. They're just not physically forced. Uh, well, uh, yeah. They, so it talks about one family here. Um, uh, one couple, and I have no idea how you would say their name, uh, Zhang and Guo Zhao. X I A O, um, you know, and um, and they're both from single parent child families. They're permitted by law to have a second child, um, but they did not fire the, file the proper application. Um, darn. 
Uh, I, I, yeah, I have minute. so many thoughts running through my mind that are probably unkosher. Um, <laughs> that's the iPhone. The iPhone is causing me to have your iPhone, terrible yeah. thoughts right now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, but they said after the birth of the second child, they were fined eleven eleven thousand dollars. You know, which you know, got to be almost you know ten or eleven years worth of salary for these people. Uh, and uh, in some cases, they're brought, you know, the threatened with job loss on top of the fine for having a second child. So even though there's the forced abortion is gone, there's other pressures. Yeah, there's plenty of other coercion. So because, um, yeah, it's like, well, great, you've got another child, but you can't afford to feed them or the rest of your family. Hmm. You know, so, <clears throat> you know, I. It, and I see, I'm still trying to figure out what the world, you know, the, the, the Chinese leaders are planning and doing because, yes, yeah, so they, they've killed off a lot of the girls. A lot of the girls yeah. are abandoned um, and in orphanages and winding up in America. And where are all these, what all these baby boys are going to, you know, young men are going to be marrying? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you I, know, there's going to be a lot of pent up uh, rage and frustration. <laughs> I. I you know, I've 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 heard uh, people speculate that well, a war would take care of that. <laughs> it's not a, a a thought that I want to dwell on, you know. Um, <clears throat> but it it does explain why our our government sort of dances around China and tends to turn a blind eye to um, a lot of the things that happen there. Um. So yeah, the, oh. it mentions specifically an organization called All Girls Allowed uh, that has been uh, speaking out a lot um, against the forced abortions and things like that. Um, and they're very excited. Uh, they even said that there was a prophecy that that policy would change um, this year. Um, and this is a first step toward that. Um, I guess we'll wait and see with that. I when when I hear people say there's a prophecy about that this is going to happen or that's going to happen, my attitude is always, well, let's wait and see. So, but it would be nice if it did. Oh, absolutely! And it's nice to see that you know, uh, um, at least one part, a, a small part. Well, not only if it's a small part, a large part of an injustice was done. Yes, there's more to be done, but you know, see some injustice overturned. It's a good thing. Uh, you know, anytime you have a step. In the right direction, it's a great it's thing. It's a step in and, the right direction. Yeah, it's it's something to celebrate, even if it's oh, just a right. step. So, yeah, praise God for that. And uh, you know, and yes, China is a very troubled country. You know, it really is. Um, it's all we can all we can say for it. Well, we're going to end tonight with a kind of an interesting article from uh, Haaretz, the Land, uh, Jerusalem paper, in which. Um, Israeli archaeologists have uncovered a 3,000-year-old cistern in Jerusalem. Now, the cistern, which is a you know place that contains – would hold water uh, at one point, um, uh, goes back to Solomon's temple. Yeah. So, okay. And it's one of the first – you don't get much stuff that that goes that far back, really. Right. No, okay. And so here's why this is important. Right? It's not just a cool discovery, but up until recent times, it was believed that Solomon didn't exist, that the temple didn't exist, that, that at that time, um, the, the, the Davidic kingdom didn't exist. And, and at the time, the, um, Israel was just a loosely affiliated bunch of nomads. All right. Whereas the Bible tells us something quite different, but these are people that are trying to say the Bible's not true. And up until fairly recently, there really wasn't much um, biblical evidence uh, to support it. Well, it's like a thousand years B.C., you know? I mean, it's there's not a whole lot of anything from that far back. Um, and so, but then they found the uh, Jerusalem Wall um, dating back that far, and now they found a cistern uh, that right. dates back to it. I, I, it got to be understood too. I mean, you know, why can't they, you know, find David and the boys? Well, again, you're dealing with three thousand layers 
of stuff that has built up. And, you know, if you say, if we dig down to get down to David and the boys, well, then, you know, what are you doing? You're going to scrape off, you know, the, 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 the Jesus level, and you're going to scrape off the Hasmonean, a uh, Hellenistic Greek level, and you're going to scrape off the Persian rule level. And, you know, you got all these other levels you got to dig through. And, and again, there's archaeological stuff in each of those levels that's like equally valuable. Right. Right. You know, so, like, uh, it was a couple of years ago, they found the, 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 the pool of Salom, you know, and actually it's interesting enough because the, the, the cistern is connected to that. So, um, you know, consequently, yeah, it's, it's hard to get down there and, and it's further complicated. Um, and that's the, the controversy tied to this is that, um, those who, who found this are being criticized uh, because they are, um, the, they said that well, you didn't dig straight down. Uh, you went, you you tunneled down next to it and kind of over, and uh, and they said you're not you're not supposed to do it that way. Well, how else are you going to get to it? But you know, it's this isn't they didn't follow established, um, you know, archaeological practice or. Um, or whatever, and and so they're they're sort of um, those who are not real happy about this discovery. Are they're trying to to say no, this it's not legit. You can't trust it because these guys aren't using you know proper procedures, and so therefore they're not trustworthy archaeologists. Right. Well, the archaeological critics, you know, I, now I don't know. I mean, I don't know much about this newspaper. I don't know much about. How objective it is. I mean, you know, it may have all the, you know, objectivity of, you know, like, you know, uh, the St. Louis American Globe papers. Democrat yeah. at one time or you know, some other newspapers and stuff out there because it's just left leaning archaeologists. Right. Yeah. Uh, attack the Israeli Antiquities Authority in light of the findings. And, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, yeah so, I mean, so from what Fox we understand, the Antiquities Israel. Authority has once again been under harnessed with. A political objectives by right wing organizations under the guise of archaeological activities. Well, I'm not sure what that has to do with finding the sister, and I'm I'm not sure you know how that that fits into to to that critique. Um, but they have been, you know, that I don't think they like the idea that the, of, of yeah the Davidic kingdom ever existing or something. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. Well, what it comes down to is the more archaeology is done. Over and over, every single time, they find something new that has some connection with the Bible. It supports the biblical account. And the few times where they found something that appeared to um, to show the Bible was not true, their response is keep digging. Right. And um, and they found oh oh yeah now now we have more evidence and um, and oh it turns out now that we we. We're misinterpreting what we had. So anyway, yeah. Again, none of this proves the Bible. Nope. Yeah, you can't prove the Bible. I'm going to, we went from that. But, I mean, well, it, it shows the Bible is historically accurate. Mm -hmm. But it can never prove the Christian faith. Right. Right. And, and what it comes down to is, even if, I mean, even if we could show um, – Proof of you know that you could find uh, if if they found a um, an art a, a journal that was written by a Roman soldier, one of the ones that was present at the tomb when Jesus rose, and it was verified to date back to that time, and 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 they looked at the style of writing, and it was in the sort of um, Latin that a Roman soldier would have written it in, or you know, or whatever. I mean, there's just, there's nothing, it, they can always come up with an excuse of why it's not what it is, you know, and, and, and what, it, but no matter what the evidence, um, not only can people even just say, um, well, just the same way that we say, keep digging, they could say, keep digging too. And well, as, um, Leonard Nimoy said on the TV show In Search Of in the 70s on an episode about Noah's Ark. 
if Noah's Ark were proved, what were found tomorrow and proved to be Noah's Ark, those who believe would say, we told you. And those who don't would say, I'm still not convinced. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I thought that was pretty, pretty insightful for Leonard Nimoy. You know, I thought, you know. Well, you know, he's pretty logical. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, what it comes down to is only the Holy Spirit can give faith. No one can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And um, so and just thank God that the Holy Spirit does come and, and does convict sinners and uh, and point us to the God who loved us enough. Um, today I talked about uh, us preaching on James, talked about God, our Father, and um, and, and hearing his voice. And, uh, and the fact that, that our father was willing to send his son for us and what an amazing thing that is. So, yep. That is true. Uh, we did have a very long, uh, email from Carlos on conversion, but I'd like to give that more time than I think we have tonight. So maybe we can put that off to another, um, that conversation off for another night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I did want to let him know that, yes, we did get it. Yep. Thanks for that. So if anybody else wants to write to us, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, and, and by the way, I'm going to start just posting these to YouTube instead of a gazillion other sites, uh, just because uh, the probably 99% of our traffic um, is from YouTube. It's, it's, it's very rare. Um, you know, like maybe one a week, uh, that we'll get, uh, somebody watching one of our videos on one of the other sites. And so it's just really not worth, uh, the effort, um, to, to do all that. So I'm just going to start posting them to YouTube, um, alone. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, then we'd love to hear from you. You can use, uh, the comments section right below the video. Uh, if you do that, um, we will respond to it uh, the the next time uh, that we record after you post your comment. So if you're um, re- you know posting on a on an old video, um, make note of the recording date. Also, we don't always get these out right away, um, and we're recording this one on September 16, 2012. So um, we'd love to hear from you that way, or you can email us at podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Or you can go to our Facebook page, uh, just search for CrossFeed News, and you'll find us, and uh, you can leave a comment there as well. Yep. I hope you all have a very good week, everybody. Take care, and God bless your day. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.